Hello, everyone. Welcome. Good afternoon. Teresa Mears is an associate professor of anthropology at UVM and the director for the graduate program in food systems. She received her MA and PhD in sociocultural anthropology from the University of Washington and completed a graduate certi certificate in women's studies. Her research focuses on the labor in the food system, food security and food sovereignty and migration from Latin America. Her first book is Life on the Other Border, Farm Workers and Food Justice in Vermont, which was written in 2019. And she's now working on her second book titled Will Work for Food, Labor Across the Food System. Teresa finds that consumers are increasingly concerned with what goes into their food and demand a healthier and more ecologically sustainable food system. However, labor is rarely part of the sustainable food discussion. Dr. Mayer shares her ongoing research on food and farm workers, focusing both on local labor concerns in the dairy industry and national conversations about essential work. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Mayers. Make sure this is all working. Sound good? Okay. All right. So thanks so much for having me on a Friday afternoon. Um, such a nice turnout. And I'm always really excited to share um, the kind of work that I'm doing on campus and off campus spaces. And so um, I'm really excited to talk a little bit about uh, work that I've been doing over the past few years. And I saw the, you know, the lineup for this semester, this fall, and you've got a couple more of my colleagues coming in, Luis, Ivanka, and Pablo Bos, and they'll be great. I'll, I'll share that they will have really interesting things to talk about. Um, so uh, thanks so much for that introduction. That's who I am. Those are the things that I focus on. Um, I've been at UVM since 2011, and um, I'm an anthropologist who studies living people. So I study people who are still alive. Um, and uh, a lot of my colleagues, the archeologists are studying more material culture, the remains of people who were once alive, but I am very interested in the people who are still alive and the ways that we um, think about culture, think about food, think about migration. Um, those are some of the big areas that I focus on. So what I'm gonna be sharing today is a little bit different than I often do when I do talks. Um, for the past four years or so, I've been doing a lot of book talks on my first book that came out in 2019, and that has been a lot of fun. Um, that research was looking at um, the experiences of dairy workers here in the state, um, most of whom were from Mexico, and their experiences getting food, accessing food, organizing for um, better working and living conditions, um, and really thinking about you know, border dynamics here in the state of Vermont um, and how that impacts immigrant workers. Um, and that was a really interesting project. And as an ethnographer, as someone who does research that is inherently talking to people, um, the pandemic has presented kind of an interesting obstacle to that. Um, you can do Zoom interviews, you can do Zoom research, but it's not really the kind of research that I really love. Um, but I wanted to stay productive. And so prior to the pandemic, um, I was talking with a close colleague and friend of mine, Laura Ann minkoff Cern, who is a geographer and she's at Syracuse University. And we were at a conference and we were talking about a class that both of us taught. Mine is called um, Food and Labor and hers is called Will Work for Food. And what we were sharing with each other is that as we teach this class, which draws a lot of students, and a lot of students are very interested in this class because they are food workers, right? They're the ones who are working at Skinny Pancake. They're the ones who are working at City Market. Um, what we realized in those conversations is that there's certain areas of food work that are really left out in the scholarship and the research on food labor. And so we thought, this is again prior, this was in 2019, we thought, well, maybe we should write this book. Maybe we should just do it together. Um, we had both finished our first books as, as solo projects. And we're like, this might be more fun actually talking to someone as we go through this process. So um, we thought about it and then 2020 came and we realized that this was really the perfect opportunity to do so. Um, that we didn't necessarily need to do more field work, that there's been so much written about labor and food systems. What we saw as our project really to pull it together. So the book that I'm going to share a little bit about today um, is forthcoming. We're still working on it. 
Um, and all of the questions and comments that you have are going to be giving me really good ideas for finishing up that book. And hopefully, if all goes well, it'll be out about this time next year if, if we meet our deadline, which it's looking good so far. So um, one of the big questions that I've been thinking through, and this was prompted by a conversation that I had with my colleague Amy Trubeck several years ago, is, um, you know, have we ever had a fair food system? Have we ever had a system that doesn't mistreat workers, that ensures that everybody has enough food, that is ecologically, environmentally sustainable? Have we ever had that kind of a system? And as anthropologists who are really interested in both kind of the current realities as well as historical realities, that's kind of an open-ended question, right? And even if we look to sort of the romantic past, right? The romantic past full of family farms and, you know, full of more localized food systems, right? Often those were dependent upon unpaid family labor. Right? If we look at current conditions of industrial agricultural production, of factories, right? Of large scale production, clearly there's not great things happening in that system either. So, what we're trying to do in this project is really to think about, is a fair food system possible? Are we, is, do we have the capacity? Do we have the knowledge? Do we have the skills to build a food system that doesn't allow people to suffer? And what would it take us to get there? Um, Laura Ann presented this uh, book at a group of food philosophers last week, and they got very heady about that very quick. They're like, wow, what does justice mean? What does goodness mean? What does fairness mean? Um, and those comments are going to be really fun for us to consider. <clears throat> but one of the things that we're trying to do through this book is to look at the experiences of workers and how their identities, their racial, class, gender, ability related identities, often are the things that people um, are exploited because of, and also what draws them into this kind of work. Um, so I'm going to give some facts and figures talk a little bit about some of the chapters, and also really make it clear that a systems approach to understanding food is for me kind of the best way, because unless we understand the food system in its entirely, in, in its entirety, right, eating fairly or eating more locally, you know, might not really address the whole picture. So um, food systems at UVM is a really hot topic right now. My class is filled the first day. Um, we have an undergraduate minor, an undergraduate major, a master's, and a PhD program in food systems. And we were the first university in the country to build that. And so I think that's no accident that the state of Vermont and being a land-grant university has provided this really fertile ground for thinking about food systems, you know, in this academic way. But I think we're all really, we know what a food system is, right? And I would venture a guess that if we look at all of our collective histories, probably 80 to 90% of us have worked with food in some way, right? Whether it was in a restaurant, whether you were cooking your children a meal, whether you had an agricultural background, whether you've driven a truck, right? All of these things really allow us to think about our own place within a food system. So for me, I grew up in the back of an ice cream store. Um, my parents owned a Baskin Robbins for most of my childhood. And you would think, oh, that would be so fun, an ice cream store, that's like every kid's dream. And there was truth to that. It was a lot of fun in a lot of ways, but I also saw the toll that that took on my mom, who was trying to manage an ice cream store in the middle of a Colorado winter when no one wants ice cream, right? Or what happens when your high school employees leave the walk-in open and all of that ice cream melts in the middle of a Colorado summer, right? I then went on, I had a lot of um, different uh, paths through the food system. I worked in catering. I was a barista in Seattle, which is very high pressure. Um, people expect a lot of their coffee in Seattle. Um, I've worked in fast food. I've worked in a lot of different sectors of the food system. And now I teach about it, which is really exciting. So when we think about the system of food, right, these are all of those interconnections, those relationships between what we often call farm to fork, right, or farm to table. And it's all of those sort of social, cultural, political conditions that shape how we eat, who we eat with, where our food is coming from, where our food is going when it's wasted, 
And it's incredibly complex, right? So I think it's no accident that we have to have entire uh, degree programs designed to really pick apart and understand its complexity. So this idea of food systems has been a really important one for Laura Ann and I to think about labor and to think about where does work fit into this, right? Where does human labor sort of enter into this picture? Where is labor duplicated? Where is labor outsourced? Where is labor exploited? Um, and it's been a really um, exciting and daunting process, honestly, to think through some of these dynamics. So um, one of the things that started this project is our own appreciation for some of the worker organizing that's happening within the area of food and food systems. So the Food Chain Workers Alliance is a national organization, and they are a huge umbrella of lots of different organizations that are working to improve living and working conditions for food workers. It involves organizations like the um, like Rock United, Restaurant Opportunity Center, Centers United. It involves groups like Migrant Justice and the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. It involves and sort of gives form to the Fight for 15, which is really an organizing place for fat, fast food workers. And in our own teaching, we've been really interested in how the Food Chain Workers Alliance um, I, identifies where food is being worked on and how people are engaging with food. What's really interesting though, is if you look across the organizing around food work, and if you look at the scholarship on food work, there's two main areas that don't really pop up. And these are areas that are absolutely essential to that food system functioning. So the first is home-based labor, okay? And the ways that we think about labor in labor scholarship, labor studies, and even labor organizing is very bifurcated, right? You have work that happens outside of the home, and you have the work that happens inside the home. And of course, as any of us who have children know, and who have seen those children who grow up, mine is five still, so she's on that road, right? A lot of what we're doing in the home around food work is creating more workers to work outside the home. And at the same time, we don't pay attention to those interconnections. And we often, because it's unpaid work, typically in the United States, we don't necessarily think about in a lot of detail how to make it better or more just. And those are some interesting dynamics. The other thing that is really missing is what happens to food when we're no longer using it, right? Food waste. And in the state of Vermont with our now our universal uh, recycling and composting law, this has actually gotten a bit more attention than it has in the past. That oftentimes, you know, you hear that saying like, there is no way when you throw it away, there is no way. And when we look at food, that's really true, right? Someone has to compost it. Someone has to put it on a trash truck. Someone has to think about the packaging of that food and whether it's recyclable or not. But yet we don't understand that as part of the labor system of food. And so in the book that we're writing, what we're trying to do is break down this really immense and complex food system sector by sector and think about um, who is doing the work within that area. So one of the things that happen and one of the things that we've been really um, kind of thinking through as we've been writing this is the impact of COVID. And I think if we all think back to early 2020, when we were faced with concerns about empty store shelves, right? The farmers who were all of a sudden selling CSA shares out the window, right? Because people were wanting to buy more locally. When we were thinking about how we had executive orders from then President Trump to keep the factories open right, because they were essential workers. So what's happened is the pandemic has given us a kind of a new viewpoint on the work that it takes to feed ourselves and the work that it takes to feed the nation. And as children, we're no longer able to go to school and all of those household dynamics really had to shift. We also have a new attention to the pressures that happen in the home to keep that family going. I was lucky enough to mostly move online. Uh, I don't love online teaching, but I could do it. I, I kept getting paid. I kept my paycheck coming from UVM. And at the same time, at that point, I had a two-year-old who could not go to daycare. And balancing online teaching with keeping a very fussy two-year-old fed with 
my husband who was also trying to stay employed, <laughs> right? These added different pressures. And at the same time, it's given us a new viewpoint to understand, you know, maybe some possibilities around change. So I think when we're looking at sustainable food or good food or fair food, this is a conversation in Vermont that is wonderfully productive, right? And I think looking at this past summer with the flooding and the impacts on our farmers, right? In this state, we care a lot about our food system. We care a lot about the condition of the lake. We care a lot about supporting our local economies. We care a lot about, you know, collectively what's going into our own bodies. But labor often slips out, right? Thinking about whose hands were picking that tomato, whose hands were milking that cow, are often not part of that sustainability conversation. And what we propose in this book is that if we are really going to build a sustainable food system, a sustainable food movement, we have to center work in that question. Because without those workers, we don't have a food system. So part of our job in this book has been to look at a lot of data. And this is, you know, we can't talk to people or we weren't able to talk to people um, as we were pulling this together. And actually this gave me a whole new insight into national questions. So I've done um, a number of years of ethnographic field work here in Vermont, working with dairy workers, understanding their concerns and the conditions of their work. But I really had not had the opportunity to step back and think about, you know, what does this look like at a national scale? And if we look at the numbers of people who are working in our food system, it is immense. And this does not include unpaid work in the home. So we have about 22 million people in the country working in the food system. And when we look at where they sort of reside, almost half of those people are working in food service, in restaurants, in cafeterias, in uh, catering, in prisons, right? All of those sort of direct provisioning of meals, okay? And if we look at the hourly wage of that, it's about $14 an hour, or sorry, $13 an hour for food service, below the livable wage in Burlington, certainly. If we look at production, right? Production meaning agricultural production, we see one of the lowest annual wages, even though farming and farm work is central to all of those other steps, right? If we look at food processing, right? Making um, tortillas in a factory, making the Oreos, cutting up the chicken in large scale meat packing facilities, right? We also see relatively low hourly wages and we also see a lot of exploitation. Okay? Waste management is an interesting thing. So waste management is a really complicated field. And as we realized, this was actually the hardest chapter for us to write because of the fact that we don't often see it as food work. It's actually one of the better paid places in the food system. It's more likely to be earning more or less uh, a livable wage, but the conditions of that work, as we might imagine, are not necessarily um, something we all would want to do. So overall, this is how we're organizing this book. We have an introduction, and then we go sector by sector through the food system. We look at food and farming um, and how um, plantation agriculture and industrial agriculture have really built a system that tends to be extremely hard on workers. We look at processing, and this was one of my favorite chapters to write, where we looked at how Henry Ford and Henry Ford's invention, well, he kind of invented it, he kind of did. Um, the assembly line then went on to shape how we make food. Um, we look at um, distribution and trucking and logistics and warehouses and all of those kind of unseen parts of the food system. Moving to retail, thinking about grocery work and corner stores and 7-Elevens and Dollar Generals and all the places where we get something to eat. We look at service, focusing mostly on restaurants and school labor, on work within the home, and then food waste. So this is kind of taking us beyond the farm to table, but kind of the farm to the table to the compost bin is what we're thinking about and still centering that question of the home. So what I want to do for the rest of the time is to focus in on three of these areas because this talk is not going to be five hours long going to be 45 minutes long. 
And I want to point, kind of paint a picture of what we know about work in this particular sector and where there's some really interesting possibilities of making change. Because what I've realized in teaching food-related uh, classes for now nearly 20 years is that when you study food, there's a lot to be upset about. There's a lot to be depressed about. My students are often like, what do we do to make it better? Like, tell us how to make it better. And that desire, I think, is very valid. So what I also want to point to are some really interesting places where people are trying to make this work better and how we might, as consumers or as people who are concerned, maybe might lend our support to that. So I'm going to start out with agricultural labor. And for Laura, Ann, and I, this is the area that we knew the best. Um, I had worked with farm workers in the state of Vermont. She has worked with farm workers in a lot of places, including New York and California. And when we sat down to write this chapter, we we're like, oh boy, how are we going to narrow this down? This is so much, right? So much to think about. And so what we really tried to think about is how plantation agriculture, right, really extractive, violent forms of agriculture that were developed to enable and to profit from slavery then became a blueprint for industrial agriculture as we know it today. So one of the things that we know, again, is that this work tends to be not paid that well. And in kinds of field work and the type of farm work where people are paid piece by piece, what we call a piece rate, you know, bucket of apples, bucket of tomatoes, bucket of whatever, those wages can be really unpredictable and seasonal, right? And that's one of the major causes of why, for example, farm workers are more likely to be hungry than the general population. It's because often they don't work in the winter, unless they're in Vermont and they work on dairies. We know that this industry has very low levels of unionization, very, very low levels. And at the same time, there's really important historical movements that are trying to organize farm workers from Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers to more recent forms of organizing of farm workers. And so what we try to understand in this is how agriculture in the United States has faced a lot of pressure to get bigger, get big or get out, right? Far, what is it? Field post to field post right, Earl Butts' a sort of idea of the need to monocrop, the need to grow large swaths of the same thing. And all of that has had, in many ways, a devastating impact, not only on the small family farm, but also on those workers who come into those large scale farms to work. And so what we know is that from the transition from enslavement to sharecropping, right, that violence persisted. And from that movement of sharecropping to becoming, for example, migrant workers in the Northeast, that violence persisted. And as we've seen shifts where now we have so many workers from outside the country creating food for us, that violence has persisted. So right now there's something, there's a figure that something like 80% of the food that we eat goes through an undocumented farm worker's hand. And that's a lot of the food that we eat. Right. And at the same time, right, that's absolutely essential work. It's work that has to happen. One of the things that we trace and that we're very interested in is how um, the treatment of workers, especially in agriculture, has been built into law. And if we look historically at the New Deal, which brought about really important changes in the United States, new protections, new safety nets, the two groups of workers that were left out of all of the labor protections in that were agricultural workers and domestic workers, right? At the time that the New Deal was written, most of those workers were African-American, right? It was a systematic way of keeping the, that work not, not just, right? And not fairly compensated. So the patterns that we see in our agricultural system, right? have long histories. And you know, it seems like there's probably a lot of history buffs in this group. So um, I think it's really important that we kind of come to terms with that. So amidst that, we're at the same time, and maybe because of those conditions, we're seeing incredibly important strategies of organizing workers and bringing better conditions to the field. And so 
Worker-driven social responsibility is a model that has had great success in bringing um, better working conditions, better pay, um, time off, having evidence of a pay stub to thousands of workers in the country. And this model is probably best connected to the coalition of Immokalee workers in Florida. Um, Immokalee being a place that has always been a really central place for industrial agriculture, first with former sharecroppers and now increasingly with workers from Latin America. And what this model does is it has really successfully located the place in the food system that has the power, and it's not the farmer. Farmers often, even the best intentions, even the most sincere desire to create good working conditions are really difficult when you're not making enough yourself. So what this model has done is it has looked to those really large scale companies that have plenty of money. Wendy's, uh, actually no, not Wendy's. Wendy's has not signed on. Um, Walmart, McDonald's, Burger King, Subway, Sodexo, Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, Pizza Hut. And what they have done is they require or they have mobilized for those companies to pay one more penny per pound of the tomatoes that they purchase. That one penny is then been responsible for immensely improved working conditions, right? And Sodexo, they can afford it, okay? Uh, ben and Jerry's, as we'll talk about with milk, they can afford it. So what else is really important about this is that the Worker Driven Social Responsibility Program has been responsible for both highlighting and eradicating slavery in tomato fields in Florida. So one of the main motivations for this organizing is that there was still cases of enslaved people working in the United States picking tomatoes. And through this organizing, one of the things that's happened is an eradication, not probably a total eradication, but uh, an erasure of that issue. It also has a zero tolerance policy for sexual harassment. So farmers who are getting the money from those higher up companies to create better working conditions for their employees, right? They're able to do that because it's not coming off of their own back, right? It's coming from these large companies. So this has had a really tremendously huge impact in agriculture in the United States and in other places. And this Fair Food Program, which is the Coalition of Immokalee Worker Program, has spread as far away to South Africa, to Chile, to Mexico, to California. And in my mind, this is one of the most exciting things that we're seeing in the food system happening. In Vermont, this has been something that I've been tremendously excited about in our own backyard. So Migrant Justice, an organization here um, in Vermont, um, an organization that I've been really fortunate to work closely with, was a part of their board for a number of years, probably will go back at some point when I have a less demanding child. <laughs> I don't know when that's going to be. Um, but what happened is that Migrant Justice started learning from Coalition of Motley Workers about how they were doing this program. And through a ton of organizing work, years of organizing work, what they've identified is that in Vermont's dairy industry and also in New York's, there's a lot of possibility for engaging in this approach in our own backyard. So 2017, it's been almost exactly six years ago, Ben and Jerry signed on to this agreement. And what that means is that on all dairy farms in Vermont that are selling milk to Ben and Jerry's, they get a price premium for their milk that allows them the money they need to provide better working conditions. And that's really cool. <laughs> um, right now, the new campaign is with Hannaford, Hannaford uh, grocery stores, so that all of the store brand milk would also come from farms with these same conditions. And one of the really interesting things about this is that what a good job looks like in these programs is designed by the farm workers themselves. It's not designed by corporate CEOs who may have never picked a tomato in their life. Right? It's designed by the workers themselves. And I think that that's really a different approach and one that we need more of. So I'm gonna move sectors into something that we probably know quite a bit more about because we interact with it all the time. Right, Going to restaurants, 
you know, at some point having our children eat school meals. This sector is a really fascinating one because of how recent it really is. And the restaurant industry and the intensification of food service is really a kind of a recent phenomenon. And it's tied in some ways to the establishment of the inn for weary travelers. And restaurants in and of themselves as places, you know, are really about 130 years old. It's not that old when we look at human history. So again, when we look at service, that's where we see the largest chunk of food workers. And this is the place where most of my students have spent some time. You know, they have been servers, they have been cooks, they have been bussers, they have been dishwashers. And it's this system, this part of the system that we all know really well. So in this chapter, one of the things that we pay attention to is the difference between working for tips and not working for tips. And how working for tips entails a whole different kind of engagement with the broader community. Part of that results in really high rates of sexual harassment. So there are more sexual harassment complaints filed within food service than in any other industry. Part of that is because if you are working for tips and a large percentage of your pay is dependent upon that, oftentimes there's toleration, right? Even if not appreciating that kind of behavior. There's also back of the house, front of the house kind of conditions where oftentimes upper management are relatively well off. They're often men and servers are often young women. And right now there's a very interesting case kind of brewing around a, a local company where there's questions of how those dynamics have played out. But if we look at fast food, right? Fast food is one of those areas where no matter how friendly you are, no matter how you know, you engage with clientele, you're usually not making tips. And that's where we've seen a lot of energy for raising the overall wage to $15 an hour. So here, we also see really low rates of unionization. It's really, really hard to organize restaurant workers. It's one of the hardest industries to organize. But at the same time, just in the past couple of years, we have seen workers organizing in ways that we have not seen for about 60 years. Part of this is through the Fight for 15. So the Fight for 15 is a national movement that is trying to weigh, uh, I can raise the wage, <laughs> it's so hard to say that, to $15 an hour. Currently that's at 725. Okay. And there has been no national level change, but many states, including California, Massachusetts, Maryland, New Jersey, Illinois, Connecticut, and Florida, and several cities, Seattle, San Francisco, and New York City, obviously very expensive cities to live in, have agreed and have committed in policy to gradually increasing wages to $15 an hour. The reality of that is that those changes have increased the wages of 26 million workers to the tune of $150 billion. So all of the purchasing power there, all of the economic sort of vitality that might be tied to that is making a number of policymakers maybe think differently about this, right? Bernie's been behind this for a long time, right? This is one of the things he's often campaigned around. But the ways that this kind of um, change would impact workers of color and women is really, really important. Because when you look at the roughly 22 million workers that are in the food system, about 12 million are workers of color. So if we're looking at addressing historical poverty, at historical gaps in wealth, these changes have actual real possibilities to change some of those conditions. The other thing that's happening is to do away with the subminimum wage. And so federally, we have something called the tipped wage, $2.13 an hour, that has been on the books for 30 years. And although there are very different realities in how that works out, in some states it's expected the management will raise that up, the federal minimum wage, if it's not earned. In some states, they've actually chosen to have a higher 
tipped wage and tips are on top of that. In general, the tipped wage spells not so great realities for restaurant workers, unless you're working at Hen of the Woods, right? Where you're likely to be working with very deep pocketed customers, right? Great place. Yeah. So one of the things that the One Fair Wage campaign is trying to do is to do away with that federal minimum wage. Because if you are working in an IHOP at three in the morning in the middle of Illinois, chances are you're not making enough tips to get by. Right? So doing away with that tipped wage would have really tremendous impacts. So that's an area that, again, when we look at some of the realities here, this is one of those things that I think has real problems. Right, policy level changes that would have really far reaching impacts. What's interesting though, is that there's some critique of this from restaurant workers themselves. So restaurant workers who really are doing really, really well with tips are sometimes questioning what would happen to their tips if these base wages were changed. And I think that's a val very valid point. So the third sector that I'm gonna talk about is the sector that we all probably know quite a bit about, right? We all at some point have lived with a family. We all have had someone feeding us. We all have probably fed others at some point in our life. But at the same time, this, these practices as labor are not often considered food labor, even though it's working with food. And so this idea of social reproduction, which is a theoretical term to really understand how in the household we actually are making more workers is a really important place that we pay attention to in this book. It's no small accident that both Laura Ann and I have two small children. Well, I have one, she has two. We have three together. And a lot of our writing sessions, we've been Zoom writing for now two and a half, three years. A lot of our sessions have started out like, oh God, if I get asked for one more snack today, I'm gonna lose it. Or hold on, I've gotta stop writing. I need to go throw this in the oven. So there's no small accident that this chapter was one that got us fired up, right? We are both working mothers, we both have young children, we both have amazingly supportive partners, but we also recognize how a lot of this work across history has been gendered. So when I was approaching this chapter, I was like, what am I gonna say? Like, I'm not, it's not just a complaint, but what am I gonna say about this chapter? And how am I gonna think about, you know, these questions as questions of work. So one of the things that we've decided to do in this chapter is to focus on these three historical moments where major political shifts or social shifts have had really transformative impacts for who is doing the cooking, who is doing the cleaning, who is taking care of the children. We start out with emancipation. And when we moved from having enslaved domestic workers in the United States to then having legally binding but not legally enforced requirements to pay people, this had huge impacts on who was doing this work. And what we saw is that for formerly enslaved African-American women, domestic work was often the next step, right? Working for white families was often that next step, even if it was for pay. We also look at kind of 60s, 70s um, era feminism and how increasing calls for women to have work outside the home and to be fairly compensated for that work were both really transformative changes, but also didn't recognize that many women of color have been working outside the home for decades. And so we try to think about sort of where was sort of mainstream 60s and 70s feminism successful in bringing about gender equality and where was it kind of had a little bit of a blinder on? It was really fun to talk to my mom about this. My mom's 82. She was firmly within this generation. And just thinking about you know, her and seeing all of these changes over her lifetime were really fun for us to consider. Then we end with COVID, because when we look at the impacts of COVID, what we know in just the first three months of the pandemic, 250,000 more women left their jobs than men. Right, almost a quarter million in three months. And oftentimes we're taking the lion's share of the work in the home. Right? And if we're thinking about women of color who are overrepresented in fast food work, meat packing, chicken processing, grocery, retail, fast food work, 
all of those pressures to be essential workers outside the home were deepened by having to also take care of children in new ways when schools were closed. So this chapter was a really interesting one to write. It was a really interesting one to think about. And it's one that I think probably stands to make maybe the most pointed argument about where we need some change. Um, and I will also say that it's also a place where we've seen really important shifts happening, you know, even across my lifetime. In those conversations with my mom, she was like, your dad never changed a diaper. He didn't change one diaper for four children. My husband Shane has changed way more diapers than I have, right? That's progress, maybe. Maybe it's maybe it's hope. But how we organize women or anyone who's a caretaker in the home is really challenging. It's really diffuse, right? It's not a factory full of people. It is thousands of homes filled with workers. And so one of the things that we've been really thinking about is how there's some really exciting and interesting research about how same-sex couples actually manage household labor. And in a lot of ways, those are actually much more fair. So thinking about where are dynamic and diverse iterations of family may be examples that we want to look to. We also think about the impacts of feminism, the impacts of new forms of feminism. But this chapter kind of leaves this open-ended question of like, how do you how do you bring change to women or men that are doing caretaking? And an answer that some people have proposed is wages for housework, right? Getting paid to do that work. That would be a very seismic shift. So I'm gonna wrap up with just a few concluding thoughts. So again, one of the questions that we've asked in here is how this food systems framework, how thinking about the complexity of the food system tied together might allow us to think of a better future for food workers? And what would that mean for conversations of sustainability? Right? We've also thought, and Laura Ann and I are very much excited about you know, calls to eat local and calls to sort of support our local food systems. But how can we bring in labor or what's often called social sustainability into those questions, right? How do we sustain the social world in the same way we want to try to sustain the natural world? And at the same time, how do we draw upon some really interesting models, things like worker-driven social responsibility, things like the Farm Bell, things like the Good Food Jobs campaign that might be creating some of these new realities. And what's really interesting is as we were writing this, we've been in this kind of time of organizing that is at the rate that we haven't seen for something like six decades. Starbucks workers, Chipotle workers, the scoop shop down on Church Street are now all organized. And that's a very different thing to think about than you know, even 10 years ago when we saw unionization really dipping. So I'm gonna wrap up just with some slides of thanks. Um, we are really excited to get this thing out in the world. We're also a lot of work ahead of us. And so I'd love to hear questions, comments, thoughts on things that you, you know, think we should consider. And we've had some really good support for this. Um, both from our own institutions, UVM and Syracuse, but also by like, an army of amazing research assistants who have been digging into the Bureau of Labor Statistics for us and finding cool pictures. And then what's also really exciting, and I want to make sure I acknowledge this, is the University of California Press, who I published my first book with. They have a special program to support first-generation authors, and I'm the first generation in my family to go to college, certainly the first person in my family to write a book. And this press is actually paying a lot of attention to how do we amplify voices that have historically not been included in publishing. And I think that's really, really cool. So I'm going to stop there. Um, we have about 15 minutes for questions, comments. Um, I only talked to about three of the eight chapters. <laughs> and so there's a lot of other things that are happening. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions and hear any ideas and suggestions you all might have. Now, now, I just keep pushing buttons. That was great. <laughs> Me too. You know, uh, <laughs> let's see if we have anything on Zoom. Yes, we do. Why is it more difficult for farmers to get temporary workers from Latin America, documented or not? What is the process for this at this time? Oh, 
That's such a good question. And that's a place where uh, the pandemic and the closing down of borders has had some really interesting uh, kind of ripple effects that actually when we close down the borders because of COVID, um, seasonal agricultural work still continued to some degree. But the process to obtain a permit to hire H-2A workers, which H-2A visas are the workers that bring um, like Jamaican workers into the state of Vermont to pick apples, um, workers into lots of the country on a seasonal basis. What you have to do is you have to go through a very lengthy process to demonstrate that there is no local labor supply before you're able to, as a farmer, go into that program. You also hold a lot of responsibilities to ensure that those workers return home, um, that they have adequate housing, that they have adequate pay. Um, it's a really lengthy process for farmers to get into. And when we look at um, different kinds of agriculture, it's also important to realize that dairy is not seasonal. So when we think about our own economy here in Vermont, 70% of our agricultural revenues in the state come from dairy, large scale dairy mostly. And there is no way to get a worker's visa to come into dairy because it's year round. It's not seasonal. And so one of the things that Leahy did while he was still in office was try to expand the H2O. He was trying to make the case for expanding the H2A program to include dairy work. Um, I'm a little hesitant about that, quite honestly, because the H2A program has been well documented to be a program where a lot of worker abuse continues. And so using that as a model, I'm a little, a lot unsure of. But it's really interesting because the number of H2A visas is very limited in comparison to the demand for it. Um, to the demand for those workers, and just the logistics of trying to get into that program often deter a number of farm workers, or sorry, a number of farmers from doing so, and then we'll hire workers off the books. Yeah, it's a really important question. Questions? Okay. Got a couple? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I heard you say, I love food earlier before the talk. So. Well, Hi. Can you hear me, everyone? Yeah. I worked in the bookkeeping part uh -huh. of the food industry yeah. in a restaurant group. Yep. I had a secret job that no one was to know that I did. What was it? It was to take and figure out the cost of all the meals that we served in a year and this information, so you didn't include taxes, yep. you do, it was just the food part. Yep. So there was a lot of just collating math. Yep. Um, and it was by meal. And those numbers went uh, to the Internal Revenue Service. Mm -hmm. And they judged the amount of dollar value of meals that were served mm -hmm. against the reported tips of the servers. Yep. And I went in when <laughs> nobody was else was working. Yep. And I was never to tell anyone that I did that because mm -hmm. there were other people in the office yep. who would have shared that with the servers and nobody wanted to anybody to know that that yeah. does that still happen. So I'm <laughs> it's really funny you bring that up because I'm married to an accountant for a restaurant group. <laughs> That's his job. I don't know that it happened. I, I'm not really sure if that sort of un, seems like kind of undercover work happens. I'm not positive about that. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised um, if that happens. I also think that this is where more formality, right, either through guaranteeing higher wages on an hourly basis or reconfiguring tips in a way that might be more formal might, I mean, there's there's various impacts, right? Workers are going to hate it, right? Servers who are trying to often do anything they can to make a you know make a dollar in a really hard industry might really dislike having to be formalized in ways that they currently can kind of slip through right now but at the same time it's it's kind of one of those things that sort of built into the system right the informality of tips the need to self-report tips that's kind of one of those things that it's kind of greasing the wheels of the restaurant industry in a lot of ways um, but I should look into that. I should ask off the record if that's one of the jobs that my partner has to do. I haven't heard that it is, but I wouldn't be surprised. 
<laughs> yeah. Is the organic movement on the rise in Vermont? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Can so, it be profitable for both farmers and workers? Yeah. So what's interesting about organic is that organic has nothing to do with labor standards. Organic has everything to do with inputs and how uh, fields and plants are maintained, grown, sprayed, those kinds of things. There are no labor conditions within organic. That said, there's this really, really well-known food systems thinker, Julie Guthman, and she wrote this book called Agrarian Dreams. And it's all about organic standards, what organic standards have done to agriculture. And I think it's towards the end of the book, she said, while organic might not actually have anything technical to say about labor, when I buy organic strawberries, I at least can hope that those farm workers were not poisoned by chemicals, right? So organic is definitely on the rise. Organic milk, you know, is an interesting, like very volatile kind of industry in the state. And organic, you know, organic practices often do have some spillage to questions of social sustainability. Farmers who want to go organic often do have concerns about labor. But when we look at the actual certification, there's nothing about labor within that. Things like fair trade have a bit more specificity about fair wages um, or fair incomes, you know, often for workers in other countries. But organic itself has nothing to say about labor. As a follow-up, um, did the flooding impact much of it? Oh gosh, the flooding has impacted so much. And there's actually, if you're, if anyone's interested, there's going to be a really good series of uh, talks at UVM um, about the flooding and about the flooding's impact on agriculture. And the last panel is going to be a panel of farmers who talk about this condition. Yeah, I mean, and it's you know, it's really uneven across the state, but. The flooding and just heavy rainfall has had a really dramatic impact, whether it's about how, you know, fields being completely flooded and then not harvestable to um, hay not being hayed at the right and kind of predictable times that, yeah, the flooding has had a really, really terrible impact on, on agriculture in the state. How that's translated to labor, I don't know as much about, it's something I'm really curious about. Um, but yeah, the floods were really, really hard for our, our local food system. Um, <clears throat> very interesting presentation, Teresa. Thanks, Mark. Um, after I retired, one of the things that we've done is to volunteer for Meals on Wheels. Mm -hmm. And I have kind of mixed thoughts about that. Yeah. Um, I think it's great that individuals who need a mm -hmm. nutritious meal are being provided that. Yep. I have a real concern about the way in which it's done, which is done in a really factory-like, mm -hmm. you know, assembly-like um, mm -hmm. process, with I think everything kind of made in Rutland and then driven to hubs, mm -hmm. and then people pick it up and then distribute it. So there's a lot of uh, disposable, you know, mm -hmm. I would think, uh, waste. Yeah. Um, in the packaging, yep. there's a lot of gasoline used in this process. Yep. Um, and I've thought about this, but I don't know how we could do something like that better. Yeah. And then there's also a dependence on volunteer labor, right? Yes, and, absolutely. And then that's a really important piece of it yeah. too. Yeah. I mean, I think that this is something that, you know, whether it's Meals on Wheels or whether it's just, you know, our transformation to eating so much takeout, you know, this is like, just the the rise of Grubhub and like Uber Eats and all of the takeout that we have seen increase with the pandemic has come with a lot of environmental waste, right? A lot of plastics, a lot of packaging. I think you're pointing to like, there's some things that we gain by things being centralized, right? Efficiency in some cases, but we lose a lot of the texture, right? We like, what I think about is if things aren't so centralized, how might we meet people's needs better? How might we accommodate various dietary needs and preferences and cultural preferences? You know, but I think it points to, in my mind, the fact that in the United States, we don't have strong enough social safety nets for really anyone, right? And that if we rely upon volunteer labor, if we re rely upon government surplus to feed our children, right? There's a lot of places where, 
in the name of efficiency, we lose some of the dignity and some of the sustainability of actually providing that. You know, it's interesting in Vermont, not the same case as Meals on Wheels, but the transition to universal school meals where now no child has to pay for a meal in the state. I mean, as a mother, this has been like, wow, this is a whole new thing, right? But I think that you're pointing to a really interesting place where we don't always have the best solutions to provide food to the people who need it most, right? And what are the externalities or the costs of that are really, really messy. <laughs> messy, messy in terms of plastic waste, but also just, you know, is that food that people even want to be delivered? Travis. Okay, so hello. Hi. Um last November, uh Vermont decided to uh pass proposal two, which abolished slavery. Um, how, if any, impact did that have in our food labor system? I haven't heard that it's had any. Yeah, that that was that was a really important kind of codification, right, to have it something that people kind of took for granted <laughs> that that was the case, but to have it actually codified and illegalized, I think, is a really important statement. Um, I am not aware of any direct ways that it's impacted the food system, but I wouldn't be surprised, partially because if well, I'll say in places where slavery persists in the food system is often so underground and so unseen that enforcing that policy in cases where they may still exist, I think would be complicated, but it would be something really interesting to look into because, you know, there are definitely cases where questions of freedom and questions of ability to move freely or agricultural workers in the state are really are really compromised. Good question. I have one more. Yeah. To, uh, to what do you owe the major improvements in the quality of food served to children in our schools? Oh boy. Uh, <laughs> whew, I'm not a school meals expert. I'm not a school meals expert. Um, and I do think that, I mean, this is where Vermont is a leader in a lot of ways. And the fact that we passed universal meals is, is a huge triumph, right? And I think that the growth and the, the amazing work of the Farm to School Network, you know, connected to Shelbourne Farms, connected to, you know, a lot of different entities has made our state really well known for the quality of food, for the, the diversity of food, for the strength of school gardening programs. I also think that doing it in a small state is a very different thing than doing it in California, <laughs> right? And so I think there's something, I've, I've heard Vermont in the food systems world described as right-sized, that we're the right size to do a lot of things really quickly, right? Because we don't have to convince 5 million people. We have to convince about 51% of 60, 650,000 people, right? So I think that that's where, you know, the size of the state and also just the strength of a lot of these networks that have been working for years is really impressive. Yeah, my kids love school food. She comes home and she, I was like, do you want me to make you lunch? And she's like, no. <laughs> so that's nice. Anyone else? In the last 10 years I've seen, I had a presentation on one innovation in the waste part of the system mm -hmm. and another innovation on the, uh, the first, the food uh, product production, I guess you would call it that mm -hmm. first block. And I wondered if you'd heard anything about them. One, in the waste part of the system, the digester that uh, was a million dollar project, but could be, could go from farm to farm to farm mm -hmm. and actually turn their manure into very yeah. um, expensive and wonderful fertilizer that they could then sell. Yeah. Is that progressing and is that helping on the waste part? Of yeah, pollution? yeah. And there's a there's actually an engineering professor at UVM that's been doing a lot of work on the anaerobic digesters. I don't know if he's working with the mobile ones. I think he's working on the ones that are situated at farms mostly. But yeah, that's a really interesting proposition, right? That taking, in general, taking something that is seen as waste and turning it into something that can be a source of livelihood and revenue is really cool. Um, right. And I know that there is quite a bit of energy around that here um, and um, research being done on it. 
And the other part was uh, I saw a documentary on a biodome kind of that you could actually produce food for a whole village, if you will, yeah. um, in one dome without soil, without the slave labor, without yeah. all of that. Yeah. And then it got burnt down oh, by some farmers know. or ranchers in the area. Yeah. I can't remember. I don't know about that. You I know there's been a lot of movement to, um, you know, to hydroponics and to different kinds of growing food um, that don't require soil in the same way. But I, I'm not familiar with that case. I could be interested in that. One more, one more question. My question has nothing to do with the information you presented or the data, but I was <laughs> very curious about the pictures that you showed. <laughs> Those the black and white pictures were from the the late the thirties or forties, and I think that the the young people today can't relate to that at all. They can't relate to a yeah. kitchen where the, the counters don't even have a toaster. Yeah, yeah. Those pictures. Um, so we had an amazingly young, vibrant person doing some of this research for us, and a lot of these are held by Library of Congress, and so Library of Congress has a really cool. Um, online archive of a lot of these images. So this is just a selection of some of the ones that will go in the book. What we tried to do in each chapter is to have a historical picture, you know, that showed kind of an early iteration of a restaurant or, you know, in this case, sharecropping families, kind of descendants of sharecroppers, and then trying to bring it up to really more recent history. But yeah, I think that that's where, you know, my students while they might look at that and see it as really unfamiliar, what I am really excited about is that my, maybe I'm just lucky, but my students have a real desire to learn those histories and to not repeat the mistakes that they made, right? So what we've been thinking about as we've, doing, we've been doing these images is that question, like who's gonna relate to these and who's gonna understand what a kitchen looked like in 1930 in a totally different historical period? But yeah, I appreciate the comment. Thank you yeah. so, so much. This yeah. is very interesting.